got Britain talking with Tom Swarbrick and Beverly Turner. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for being here today. So today we are expecting an announcement from the Chancellor, aren't we? The long-awaited announcement that I think we've sort of been nudging yeah. for for quite a long time. Um, so we don't actually know, but we can make quite a good educated guess here. We know that sort of up until now the government has said that they will give people £200 off their bill from October, which would be repaid over five years. It is expected that that sum will be increased and possibly doubled, and the important bit is not have to be paid back. Yes, like you say, Holly, we've all been waiting to see what he will do. People are genuinely struggling. Um, the detail of it, uh, I think this, this notion that he was going to give people £200 off and you'd have to repay that over five years. I mean, it was <laughs> ludicrous. So the idea now that that's being doubled and you won't have to pay it back will come as a relief. Is it enough? I think probably not. I think also... What occurred to me is that this should be means tested. Don't universally give this money to everybody because there are a lot of people who don't need it. The four of us don't need that. Mm. So let's look at who needs it and give it to the people that need it. Mm. And, and, you know, that's got to be a more equitable way of distributing it. And then give them more. Give people who need it more. There's so much discussion over that as to how you do it, how you target it. It is, it seems, ludicrous that it should be across the board. Yeah, it's got to go to the people who need it the most. Uh, what isn't so far in here, but we'll wait to see, is any uplift in benefits, which is what Conservative MPs and lots of people mm. have been calling for. That £20 that was taken yeah. off universal credit at the end of the lockdowns, should that go back on? That would seem like a fair and equitable way of doing it. It would be expensive. Mm. So one of the things that the Chancellor is going to do, having said that this would not be possible and shouldn't happen, is a windfall tax on some of the energy companies to help pay the 10 billion quid or whatever it's going to cost to do all this. Mm. Um, so it's, uh, it is a sign, I'm afraid, not to be churlish about the support that's going to be offered to people. That is a good thing. But it is a sign that the government still is slightly all over the place about how to pay for it, how to target it. And that is going to affect them politically because a lot of Tory MPs are very, very worried about this. Well, concentrating too much on their rubbish parties. I mean, that's <laughs> the problem, isn't it? The, th the thing is here that, mm. you know, you have uh, VAT, which could be cut on fuel... Um, uh, it's it, uh, household bills are the ones that are the most terrifying. Fuel bills, electricity bills, are the most terrifying. Mm. You think it's taken a long time here? And eight hundred quid is going to be the average amount that bills go up in October. And the head of Ofgem was warning this week that that's just the start. That it's going to get worse mm. from there. And you think there are millions of people who are not going to be able to afford this, who might you know say thanks very much for a couple of hundred quid off their bill, but it's not even going to touch the sides. And the government is going to have to toe a very difficult line between saying, here's some help, praise us for it, but also we can't completely sort you out because we bankrupt the country or whatever their mm. argument's going to be. It's going to be very, very difficult. Well, the Chancellor will be speaking at some point this morning, later on this morning, so we'll keep across that and let you know of any developments there. Should we talk about this party uh, gate thing? <laughs> Why not? Zugri? Shall we? <laughs> Why not? Still? done it every day <laughs> yeah. last yeah. five years, so much to do it now. Um, the interesting things, I think, that come out here is some of the behaviour of that party. Uh, they were saying, you know, there were reports of someone being sick, two people involved in a fight, the Prime Minister's son's swing was broken... Somebody provided a karaoke machine. I mean... It paints a bleak picture, well, does it not? It really does. Of those people who are meant to be running the country. And the big question, again, that nobody... None of the journalists were really grilling him on yesterday is, why were none of you scared? Why were none of you in that building scared? Because most people were avoiding relatives, avoiding parties. I mean, Boris Johnson's excuse that he had to keep up morale because somebody was leaving and it was his job to go in and to toast them... Well, there were bosses running companies all around the country that weren't doing that. Mm. So why were they the exception? Well, you wonder why, whether he caught COVID whilst he was eating a rubbish sandwich <laughs> and drinking orange juice. Quite. Um, and there's, there's, the suggestion is that the Sue Gray report was going to be the thing that did for him in the end. Mm. And, it, <clears throat> and the reality is, I think, that most people... For most people, this is the end of Partygate now. They're done with it, they're bored Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. They've had yeah. enough of it. That doesn't mean that it is going to be the end of the difficulties for Boris Johnson about Partygate, and nor should it be, in my mm. view. I think this is going to act as another mm. notch on, you know, whatever view the Tory party is going to have of their Prime Minister, which says it, he's not the really thing is, good. The report revealed Downing Street Chief Martin Reynolds' text messages who said, we seem to have got away with yeah. it yes, after one of the lockdown-breaking parties. They knew. Ooh. So... We got they got away, away with, with it. it. So they knew what they yeah. were doing. 
was duplicitous in terms of how we would view it. Look, ultimately, there will be an election next year and the Conservatives have to decide whether they're going to win that with Boris Johnson at the helm. Boris Johnson is a journalist. That's what he was. He's a cut-and-paste journalist, we've all known them, who like a boozy lunch and they don't actually want to do the work. They want an editor to just put their copy together and they take a bit of credit. So the Conservatives got in there. He was very popular. He had a good public... Um, a lot of warmth from the public for Boris Johnson. There always has been. But they have to make a, a firm decision now about whether he takes them into the next election. Who is waiting in the wings? Liz Truss is a possibility. Interestingly, there was a survey of Conservative Party members recently and they voted unanimously for Ben Wallace mm. to lead the party into the next election. There's uh, it's a long time, a year in politics, isn't it? So, uh, so there they is. kicked the can down the road such a long time, everyone got bored with this one. Yeah. Uh, then they, yeah. you, know, you look at the parties and think, well, I'm glad we didn't go anyway, because they're pretty <laughs> rubbish. Yeah. Uh, but, you don't uh, like warm wine. But, in <laughs> but, but, well, we were, we were all locked in, well, quite, of course. Yeah. Quite. Thankfully, we could come to work. But um, as far as it, that, that year is concerned, I suppose it's what happens next. No. I just don't... I, look, maybe I'm wrong about this, but the people I speak to on the show on LBC, they, people are not going to rebuild their trust in Boris Johnson that they had in Boris Johnson before the next general election. It's gone. And that's why this is over for most people. They've already made their mind up. The guy's probably lied about it. The greased piglet has squirmed free once again from the initial uh, uh, fallout of this. The reality is I just don't think people are going to, at the choice of the next general election, are people going to vote for Boris Johnson to continue to lead the country? I don't think many died in the wool Conservative voters would be persuaded that that would be the right thing to do. OK. Um, let's talk about Ricky Gervais now, because he's defended making jokes about taboo subjects after the release of his Netflix special, Super Nature. I mean, he's not the first comedian to come under fire. This seems to be a bit of a, a trend at the moment. Um, US uh, LGBT groups um, have labelled the show dangerous, saying that it's anti-gay, anti-trans. Um, he's come back in defence of this, and he says, of course, in real life, I support trans rights. I support all human rights, and trans rights are human rights. It's mad to think that joking about something means you're anti it. Most offence comes from when people mistake the subject of the joke for the actual target and this has been a conversation quite a long time that are we losing an essence of comedy because people are too yes, afraid to offend 100%. anyway. Yes, 100%. And I've been thinking about this a lot. I'm doing a monologue about this tomorrow night on GB News and so this has been very much on my radar and my feeling is that the difference between those people who are perpetually offended and those who open-heartedly look at humanity in all of its different shades are the people who can and can't take a joke. And I'm not talking about, you know, the boss who might sack the intern because she can't take a joke when he's making a joke at her expense. Mm -hmm. We have to be very careful to make sure that if actuality events in real life which affect people is very different to a comedian. It doesn't even have to be a comedian. To a group of mates sat around a table, knowing they can make jokes without wishing genuine harm on the subject of that well, Joe, Hulk, you made a point earlier on to well, say... Well, no, I was just saying around sort of our family table, the extended family, when the cousins and the aunts and uncles... Yeah. I mean, there is no more brutal arena than that. <laughs> Absolutely. However, there is no more love felt in a exactly. room yeah. at the same time. But exactly. There is a, that sometimes there is a difference, though, and I think that's where, upon your own self, you have to know where the line is, don't well, you? The, alter, you know, the intention is the key the thing. Intention. Intention. The intention is the key thing. Absolutely. Ricky Gervais, actually, which I watched it yesterday, I think it's hilarious. I laughed along the whole way. Whether that makes me a bad person, maybe it does, I don't know. But the intention is very clear of Ricky Gervais. He's there to make you laugh. He's mm -hmm. there to poke and prod and, yes, maybe shock and shame. But the whole intention is to make people laugh. It's not to gratuitously upset and harm people. Mm -hmm. If people feel offended by it, that's how they are going to feel about whole, it. That doesn't mean the whole British thing gets shut British sense of humour, we've mm -hmm. always been cynical. We take the we mickey. Take the mickey. A, a joke has always got something at the centre of it, right. whether in the old days it was a mother-in-law, an English Irishman and a Scotsman That's or whatever. Right. But if, you, if every single person on that scale is offended, there is no joke. There mm -hmm. can be no mm -hmm. humour. Self-censoring is very dangerous and it leads to division. And so often now in conversations, we're, we're constantly having to worry, are we going to upset somebody by saying this? Are they going to take it in the wrong way? And laughter builds bridges. Mm. That's what it does. It brings people together. We'll all know if we've fallen out with a family member or a friend or a partner or whatever, you only know you're over it when you can all laugh about it, right? Otherwise, it's the elephant in but the room that makes like everybody a feel of like they're on with comedy, though, because in like 
previously those subjects were off limit and there were certain areas and certain groups of people that felt, you know, the, were the target, were because, the butt of the joke yeah. constantly. Because of so stereotyping. Feel, yeah. In a way, that's what those... The jokes that are funny but also can sometimes hurt is because of the stereotypes that we used to be attached to black people, to the mother-in-law, to uh, anybody, the Irishman, like you say. I think we've gone beyond stereotypes now. We're at a point where those stereotypes no longer, Let's I would like to think, exist. I, I just, I, I, listen, I just think self, self... I don't think there is actually that much wrong with self-censoring. Checking the thing that you're about to say yeah. about whether or not it's going to upset someone unnecessarily and gratuitously is probably just the polite thing to do. Mm -hmm. But if you're a comedian on a stage trying to make people laugh, I, I think the world's your oyster, go for it. And if people are offended, well... Sorry, that's how they're going to feel about it. Yeah. If someone made a joke about you and your family, would you be offended by it? You might be. Does that mean the person can't make the joke? Probably not. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Thank both. You both. Thank you.